The question is, who understands it? What is the community's role? Exactly what's happening within the system? Where are we? What can we expect? And a lot of other questions that I'm not going to ask, ask right now. But we are very fortunate today, not only to have the panelists earlier to do the great job that they did. So we're very fortunate today to have uh, the <coughs> superintendent of Jefferson County Public Schools who has never hesitated to step forward and engage, even though he knows there's always a pit somewhere along the trail. <laughs> But he stepped forward uh, because, uh, in my estimation, he's demonstrated his commitment to communicate effectively with the public and keep them abreast of what he's doing. That is very important. I think he deserves a round of applause on the front end of this discussion. Today. <laughs> Having said that, I'm going to take a seat and I'm going to turn this mic, or he will take his mic and just give him open time to express whatever he would like to express within this context, and then we'll get down into a Q&A. Thank you. Dr. Polio. Thank you, Senator Neal, and I appreciate all of you all being here uh, this evening and being invested in JCPS um, and the hard work that's taking place. I hope, um, you know, whether agree or disagree with um, some of the things that are happening, the stances that are being taken with board members or staff, to know that, um, uh, both board members, our board and our staff, is very committed uh, to improving JCPS and especially in the area of equity. Um, you know, I, it's well known that I've been in this district now for uh, 23 years. So my first day on the job was August 15, 1997, when I drove down to Shawnee High School. I was the basketball coach at Shawnee, um, and I was a social studies, actually taught social studies and health at Shawnee High School. Um, after some time there, I went to Wagner High School where I was basketball coach and teacher and assistant principal, or athletic director and assistant principal and had the opportunity um, to be the assistant principal of this lovely young lady over here, Latasha Alexander. So it's one of the benefits of being in this job. There's not a week that goes by that I don't run into a former student um, and talk about the times that I've had with that former student. Then I became the principal at J-Town for eight years, uh, the principal at DOS for two years before I got suckered into this crazy job that I have now. Um, and I often think that if I could go back in time in Dr. Brown's DeLorean and go back to May of 2017 when I got that fateful call, I wonder if I'd make the same decision of applying for this job because it is probably the most challenging job that anybody can have. But the only reason I tell that to you is I would, I'll say this, I would do it again. Because number one, I care for JCPS being in this for 23 years, uh, more than anyone can imagine because of kids, I say kids, she's got now her own kids, but because of Latasha and the many students um, that I run into on a regular basis who tell me that I said something or did something at school that made a difference in their lives and that's the power of this work and all too often we don't get to know that and it does it does keep me up at night to think of the times over 23 years when i didn't make some statement or do something for a child that had the opportunity to do that because i'll be candid with you way too often in my career i've turned on the news and one of the students that i taught or i've worked with um, was either has passed away um, or might be going to jail, or not, not been successful in one way or another. And that keeps me up at night. But this is the reason I do this work, is because I care so much about the kids and the colleagues and the schools that I've been at and JCPS. And there are so many people, despite the public narrative, the people in the 17,000 people in this school district care about kids. They care about kids. But one thing I'm gonna tell you is I've known that in, for 23 years, I look back to my first day in JCPS, and a lot of things have come and gone, programs, initiatives, the way we teach and learn. But the problem that we have is 35 facilities that are past end of life, well past end of life. Bonding capacity is how, so we have these things called bonding capacity, which right now is about $250 million that we can essentially take out loans to build new schools. That sounds like a lot. That's about six new schools 
And on top of that, we have to fix HVACs and roofs and all of these things that are failing on us right now. And if we don't do something in 10 years, our infrastructure will be unsustainable. I can guarantee you that we're, we're sustaining it right now. In 10 years, it's unsustainable. Just to fix an HVAC in a roof at a school, at a high school costs about 35 or $40 million. And the kids come in after the summer and notice nothing new. We've got to do something different in this community. And the solution to that is the adoption of the nickel tax, authorization of nickel tax. That is purely a local consideration, is it not? That is correct. Um, Although the state and legislature could do something that makes it non-recallable. Um, I know there's probably not a lot of appetite for that in Frankfurt, um, but just about every other district in this state has implemented a nickel tax. JCPS has never done one, and as a matter of fact, the superintendent, um, I can't find anywhere where it's really been discussed by the superintendent just because it's a political nightmare, let's be honest. Um, raising taxes is not a popular move, especially in today's day and age. But my job here, and I know our board believes the same way, we have a responsibility to our students. And when you look at a school building, and, and I'll say this, drive out to Oldham County, look at their schools, look at ours, um, and I think it is symbolic of what a community thinks of their schools and their children. And I, I know that sounds harsh, but I believe we've got to do something different to show our students. And what happens in the school is much more important, there's no doubt, but the facility matters too. I don't think you could put it any clearer than that. Um, with respect to the racial equity policy, um, I heard great things today. I, in fact, I was encouraged by what I heard, but I had to uh, think, in fact, I've heard that not everyone, and you never get everyone, but a significant number of people do not embrace the racial equity property at various levels within JCPS. I'm not talking about actively working against, I'm talking about embracing, seeing the value in it. Do you detect, are you aware of any of this? Is this a problem? And if it is, is there a plan to deal with that? Yeah. Well, let's, let's be, um, you know, anytime any initiative is district-wide, any initiative is district-wide, you have significant pushback from stakeholders within a school. And we have a principal here that knows that. that and it, just if you're in a school and you are trying to implement an initiative in one school, you are going to get, you know, you're gonna have the believers that are on board and are ready to do the work. You're gonna have those in the middle that are kind of like, well, this might be something new and I'll wait it out and see what happens. And then you're going to have some that actively push back against it. Um, that is a reality. So whether we're talking backpack, um, our systems of instruction in a school, PLCs, professional learning communities, which is teachers coming together um, to work, you are going to have that pushback. And it's no different in racial equity. What makes it more difficult, I think, in racial equity than any other for us, we all know there is a political context to this work too, and in this political climate that we live in today, it just adds that um, much more, diff the national narrative um, around race, the state narrative around race, makes it much more challenging. You know, I wanna say this, and I know our board chair is here, Ms. Porter, um, that was, just passing the racial equity policy was a, a bold, bold vote and step. Do you know how many districts we had? What we uh, is, um, um, we're in a group called the Council of the Great City Schools, 76 largest school districts in the United States. And John Marshall did a presentation about our racial equity policy and the work we're doing. And do you know how many districts came up to us afterwards and said, well, I'm glad you guys are leading the way because we're not gonna do, we, we can't get that passed, we can't do that, our board won't pass it, there's too much pushback in our city against it. And our board did chose not to do that. So I'm not saying we are where we need to be, but having every school implement a plan, holding uh, schools accountable for that plan, working it hard, uh, professional development, hiring, you know, I'll go back to this again. 
Um, you know, we are better in a better position than we've ever been of hiring minority teachers, principals, assistant principals, and counselors because of this racial equity policy. We have identified 2,000 more gifted and talented students as a result of the racial equity plan. Now I'm going to say, a lot. Here's the problem in education: no one wants to no one wants to build the foundation and allow it to take root and be successful. And so these are things that I think will make a difference 5, 10, 15 years from now like we have never seen before. But to answer your question, are where we need to be? Not at all. Do we have everybody on board? Nope, not at all, and we continue to work with that. The hardest part of any type of initiative like this, whether it's racial equity, whether it's deeper learning and backpack, it requires a change of heart and a change of mind. Um, and we're working that, and it's difficult and tough work, um, but I'm proud of what we've done and being one of the only about 12 districts in America who are willing to take it on, but not because I want to trump it, like look what we did, because I know we need it. Our gaps are huge, and we've got to make change. You may have answered part of the question. I know that, or at least I'm told that uh, there are schools that are predominantly black, but the administration and teaching is all white, is that correct? Well, we've done, uh, and I'll say this, the, the work, um, so yes, there are a few, I will say that, okay. uh, that I'm not gonna hide behind that, that um, there is that. The work we've done at, in administration is much more rapid than the work we've done on teaching. Um, so there is no doubt when we look at teaching staffs and we say that um, there are very few teachers of color throughout our district in school. So I want to tell you right now we're at about 17 or 18 percent of our teacher population is African American, where we know 36 percent of our students are African American. That's not acceptable. Now this is a challenge in all uh, cities across America and actually the amount across America the amount of our percent of teachers that are African American has significantly declined since Brown versus Board of Education. And that's a big problem. And so, you know, I think too often we just say, well, it has to be the post secondary institutions should be getting us more teachers that are African American. But we just can't hope there. So I do want to talk about an important program that I'm going to make sure Latasha is in. Um, starting next year, the teacher residency program. The teacher residency program, we're, we're in, our board is investing about a million and a half dollars into this initiative. And this is what it is. Latasha, sorry if I'm using you a lot. Latasha is a student who has a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. She is working in an instructional assistant at Carrick Elementary and she wants to be a teacher. But for Latasha to become a teacher, she would have to now go back to school re-enroll in school, she has two children, and essentially go back to school full-time, pay tuition to get her teacher certification. For most adults, that's not an option, although we have tons of teachers, especially minority teachers who have bachelor's degrees who want to work. They actually work in our school system now, but they want to be teachers. So next year, we implement the teacher residency program. Latasha will be in that program. She's going to uh, work Monday through Thursday under a master teacher in a classroom getting her observation hours and her work. She will be working and so we'll have two to three adults in a classroom, a high needs school, working with kids. That's part of her program, working with that master teacher. On Friday, she will go to the University of Louisville during the workday and take all of her classes on all day Friday. And she will get a scholarship and support. Class Act Federal Credit Union is going to provide scholarship money and in 12 months, she will be a certified teacher in her classroom and never have to go to school at night or on the weekends or quit her job to go to school. And so we can make sure she continues to get her income, support her family, go to school during the day, and in one year be a certified teacher in a classroom. Now that's, that's about a million and a half dollars to do that. Next year we'll have 30 candidates. I don't go into a school. I was in Western High School. Security guard came up to me, said, I want to be in that program. I've been a security guard for seven years. I said, you have your bachelor's degree? Yes, I do. Kids love them. I said, you're the one. We're going to get you in this. But we'll have 30 next year. I believe 
in a year, two years, three years, we need to have 100 per year, JCPS grown, JCPS certified, that go right into a classroom. Well, let me tell you, that's impressive. That's good. But let me also ask you then, is this, this is a part of a strategy, um, but is there a plan, a written plan that's scaled to achieve uh, uh, the hiring of, teachers of color, i.e. African Americans and others, um, that actually targets a timetable to achieve that. Is there such a plan? Yes, that's a part of our equity plan, racial equity plan that we put together that, that holds us accountable um, for uh, benchmarks along the way and details the plan for both teachers yes in every aspect of it but specifically for teachers and administrators so I'll say this we've hit the mark on administrators we have not hit the mark when it comes to teachers but you and, have a plan yes we do we have a plan and we are working it now um, we also have and this is coming with uh, outside post-secondary institutions like Simmons College of Kentucky that we working on those that might not have a bachelor's degree yet to get them into a teaching program we are also developing our own in our academies of Louisville which is let's start teacher programs where we identify our own kids who want to be teachers put them on a teacher pathway and then get them into post-secondary institutions and make them assure us they're coming back to JCPS but here's the key so, question yes are they scaled to get there that's the key yes they are with benchmarks you along know, the way okay so this deficiency that you <coughs> identify, which you didn't create, uh, you see it as that it's achievable to overcome that within a specific timetable, and there's a plan scale to get it there. Yes, I do, um, without a doubt. I, I am worried more about the teacher percentage because we have such a long way to go from eight, 17, 18% to 35, 36%. We have to double our teachers of color in the next four years. I mean, that that is what um, keeps me up at night, one of the many things that keeps me up at night, um, but that is a big challenge. So, um, yes, but we have the, the plan and the targets in place to get there. We have about three minutes, short questions, short answers. Sure. The state uh, a committee just approved firearms on certain personnel, trained personnel in every school that has over 250 students in it. In other words, Frankfurt, that proposal tends to mandate that. I have questions, I raised it earlier today, I've offered an amendment to May, uh, so that those who are closest to the culture of the school and their situations factor in what they need and don't need at a particular level. What do you feel about those two positions, or do you have an opinion? Well, I mean, clearly I've thought for many, one of the things that I think JCPS has not done is uh, implement their own um, school resource officer division, which most large districts across America did 10, 15 years ago. And the reason to do that is so that you can train the officers, you can require what they do. They work for JCPS. So if there is an issue, uh, we can hire, we can fire, we can do all of those things we can hire the type of personality that we want. So we're building that and working through our board. Clearly they disagree on this issue. There's no- What about mandating firearms? Well, um, I would- As opposed you know, to the district. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think any time that a district uh, local decision can be made, I think that's an important way to go, a local decision to be made. But I have to say, um, my job as superintendent is to also follow the law. So whatever that law may be, well, I have to implement it. I expect you to follow the law. I'm trying to get your opinion because this is subject matter that's under consideration now. Uh, I'm getting ready to let y'all go, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> What's your opinion? Would you rather have that local discretion is the question. Well, on, on all issues from the state, I prefer local discretion. Okay, that and I think correct. that's a valuable but, position. So look. Here, here's where we are. I promised that uh, I was going to let Superintendent Polio go. Uh, he answered a lot of, he anticipated a lot of my questions, and I thought he did a fine job of presenting himself. Uh, Superintendent Dr. Polio, uh, I admire the work that you do, and I know there's a lot more that has to be done, and I know you're in a very difficult position. You can't do it all in two seconds. 
And uh, the question is, are those policies good policies? Are the commitments there? Do you have sufficient resources? And is there a community behind you? I'm trusting that we can get all those things done. I want to thank you for taking the time out and joining us here today. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Marty Pope. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate your support. I appreciate it. He said I did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> did he not? <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this, this is going to conclude our program today. I want to thank you all for taking the time and coming out today. As you notice, we don't we don't uh, try to uh, go lightly around any question. We go at it, but I have to give kudos to our, our guests for being very direct in their response. Thank you so much for coming out. Stay Thank with you. Me. God bless you. Go Cards.